I'm Joanne Wilson, and this is Positively Gotham Gal. Real, honest, and meaningful conversations with women entrepreneurs and their approach to life, business, and everything in between. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Well, we're just going to dig in. Um, I hope everything is going well in the world of politics. Um, You know, I was talking to someone the other day just noting is there's been no PR, I guess that's going to start after November, that we actually have an election in June. 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 And, And many people don't realize it's in June because it's usually in September. Yeah. And the first year that it's in June. So, yes. I think it will pick up after the election, absolutely. Let, let, let's hope so. I mean, let's hope a lot of things happen after the yes. election. <laughs> All right, so we're just going to get into it. All right, well, thank you for coming. You're running for mayor of New York City, and you have framed your campaign as a break from traditional elected leaders, um, defining yourself as an unconventional candidate. You want to talk about what that means to you and um, you know why you've chosen to dive into this? Yeah, I thank you, Joanne. It's such it's so great to be here with you. And let me just say, part of unconventional is, uh, first of all, you know, I am a longtime racial justice advocate, and that is not very conventional for what we generally see in who runs for public office. So having spent 30 years of my career, having gone to law school for the purpose of trying to dismantle structural racism, which is what we started calling it way back in 2002, <laughs> trying to get people to understand, you know, no one lives single issue lives, that it's really about how we think about schools and housing and health care and food, transportation, like all of these things. Up are in what the we, big yeah, things. Up, these, mm-hmm. these big things doesn't mean you work on them all at once or that you don't have specific things you do within each one of them, but you have to understand that's what you're trying to change, to make work for people. And that that's and and that that is a background and particularly as a child of activists, you know, who are active in the civil rights movement and active in creating and helping to create the economic justice movement, that that's a background that's pretty unconventional. And then add the fact that I'm a black woman in a city that has never elected a woman of any race. That is correct. And has, <laughs> and has only elected a person of color once and for one term. That in and of itself makes me unconventional. Yes, it certainly does. I mean, we are seeing so many people enter politics later in life. When was it that this little seed started in your brain and thought, you know what, I could do this. And this is like, in many ways, it, it connects all the dots of what I have done the past 30 years. Yeah, there's so many little seeds. You know, when you look back at, if I look backward, I can see probably a lot of little seeds that led here, but not that I was conscious of at the time, right? I think the, the, the seed that I was very conscious of was after the 2018 elections, where we were also in this intolerable, in unjust, corrupt uh, Washington, watching it spill into our communities in terms of how it was undermining us both as a nation, uh, but it was also undermining us at local level, cutting budgets, cutting services, attacking leaders for not agreeing with the president, all the ways in which it spun out. Um, And watching all those women, including women of color, who had never thought about running for public office before, uh, jump in was so inspiring. And I don't mean that that was the decision point for me. I think that planted a seed though, right? And for me, um, what came next was as things progressively became worse, you know, we never, we never hit bottom with this administration. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. So it was wonderful to have those midterms. It was, but you know, as we saw with impeachment, the fact that we couldn't even impeach a president who would essentially publicly admit it to his abuse of power. It's shocking. Uh, it's shocking. But we had him also out loud and directly saying he was going to cut New York uh, off at the knees because we were a sanctuary city, because we tried to protect 
our residents who are undocumented and seeing them as members of our community. Those were the kind of things that required really effective local government, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that resistance isn't, is, must happen at the national level, that we need regime change and we need different types of leaders at all levels of government, but it made it so much more important that we have bolder and more transformational leadership around what we could do in this city as a city, right? Despite the fact that we had the disaster that we had in Washington. And that really was what started me down this path. That, and I think another thing that happens to many women, which is, I wasn't thinking about running for mayor until some people started saying to me, you should think about running for mayor. <laughs> right. And you know, we as women typically don't. don't. Yeah. And I hope that more women begin to start thinking about that. Um, it looks like they are. Um, so that's a really good thing. You talk about cutting services. How do you change that? Or is it, is it, is it raising taxes or is it just shifting how we spend our money? Because we have a lot of money. We have a lot of money and uh, we have a big budget crisis. So I'm not going to pretend we don't. We're no, looking, we're like nine billion or something in the hole. We're, yeah, we're looking, we're at nine billion in the hole. It's a revenue crisis though, right? Because of COVID. So we're at nine billion in the hole. We're looking at an average of 7.9 billion in deficits over the next three years. That's a projection. We could try to change that. But the point is uh, we're looking at a, a three to four year hole. So there's no question we have to think about cutting expenses, but we have to cut them smartly and we have to recognize we still have assets. And so one of the things that, that means is, yeah, we do need regime change in DC. We do need more help from the federal government and from the state, but we also have to think about what we can do as a city, regardless of what happens at those levels. And one of them, for instance, is to take a crisis and as Barack Obama would say, don't let a crisis go to waste. Sure. I would much prefer not to have this crisis. Do not get me wrong. It has been devastating and a humanitarian crisis of massive proportion. Uh, but one of the things that we have to do to recover in a way that reimagines us and, and starts turning the dial back on homelessness is recognizing most of homelessness is an eviction crisis. Uh, we, could, we should call them the evicted, right? As opposed to the homeless, because they're yeah. the evicted. And we're looking at 400,000 people, families potentially being evicted by the end of this year alone. Um, oh one of the things it, uh, it's, it's, but we have vacant space. Yes. We have vacancy. And by the way, we had vacancy in, in, in developments even before COVID. So there was already an issue of what our housing stock looked like and who was renting. So this is an opportunity for us to think about what should the city be buying? Why leave it to speculators? Uh, could and should we be buying up using our resources to buy properties in order to create affordable and permanently affordable housing? I think that's something we, sh we should be seeing right now. The, the other thing is how we think about this eviction crisis in a way that protects folks from eviction and, and understands it also as a revenue crisis. I am not naive. Uh, that does mean we have to figure out a way to ask, ask every New Yorker to come to the table with what they can contribute. And there are many different things that New Yorkers can contribute. And yes, there we have New Yorkers who have the ability to contribute more money. And I think, and I, and I believe this from conversations I've been having with folks, with a vision for what that money does, for how it helps the city recover, for how it staves off one of the largest humanitarian crises we have seen since the Great Depression, that I think New Yorkers are ready to step up. What they need is the leadership that calls us together to do it with a vision that people can buy into. I think you're right. I mean, 400 families, that is absolutely devastating. As well as I'm sure that a, a percentage of those families, if they had a house and they could figure out over time how to actually buy that house and have ownership over that house, that's another issue we've had, um, particularly in the Black community who's been so... Um, dismissed by the banks and given very different mortgages than their white counterparts that they could never pay that off, that eventually they were gonna lose the houses from day one. Yeah, that's a critically important issue because as we know, and as someone who comes from a background at looking at the racial wealth gap, you know, we talk a lot about 
income and income is critically important. We need people to be paid enough to be able to support their families and pay the rent. Mm -hmm. So why we have an eviction crisis is people can't afford the rent. But we also need to look at how we build wealth, savings, and equity in home ownership. Actually, in, in one study out of Brandeis University, it was the lack of home ownership that accounted for 40% of the racial wealth gap, not education, equity in a home. That makes complete uh, sense to me. Yeah. To me too, because I know that it's part of the way, you know, so many, my, my grandmother was able to give me a little bit of money to help me through college because she owned a home. And that's, that is so often the way it's done. That's one of the ways in which we support our kids also having more opportunity. So what we have to do is really figure out both how to make sure property taxes are fair and equitable. We have to make sure that we're helping to preserve you know, people's ability to stay in their home. And so there, that, that requires more than one strategy, but it also means we should be looking at how we increase home ownership where it's possible. Right. And as we see in a, in a city that is seeing vacancy, in a city that it, that 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 needs to make sure that we are able to both um, attract people, but also retain the people who are here, like make sure we're placing people. That's a real strategy we should be leveraging for sure. I mean, there's also more more homes, more roofs over people's heads, also lowers the prices of other places in the city because there's more competition, which actually is much better for New York in the long run. Um, so, you know, there's been this tremendous also increase in youth engagement in politics. You know, what do you think of this next generation and where they're going? I mean, you've got kids, so you're plugged into that. Yes, I am. I got you. <laughs> and, you know, I'm so, I, I, my kids get mad at me when I say this. I'm, I'll say it and then I'll tell you why they get mad. <laughs> so, the first of all is I am totally inspired by this generation because this generation is not apathetic. This generation is active. This generation is saying, you all are not thinking big enough. You're not thinking bold enough. And as a result, we are inheriting debt we can't afford and we're inheriting an environment we can't sustain. It's, and, we are, and, and we are inheriting racial inequity, gender inequity, gender identity issues that we just don't agree with your, your with your generation on. Yeah. And, and the activism that it's brought back to petition government peacefully, to demand bigger and bolder is completely what we need as a country and as a city. We need this new kind of energy. And every time we have gotten transformation as a country that's made us better, it is because We've had a young generation that says the old ways don't work anymore. Now, they get mad at me when I say, oh, I'm so inspired. Your generation is going to going to do it. And because they say to me, you know, mom, your generation messed it up. So we really don't appreciate <laughs> you being so happy we're going to fix your messes. And I think fair enough. It is, is fair true. enough, but that's how democracy works, right? One screws it up, the other one fixes it. I mean, they must be insanely proud of you, but you know, I've seen some um, politicians um, or even just people who are very involved in the city and want to do more for create these um, round tables, essentially, of people that are very smart, talking about issues that can come back to the mayor or other people in power. This is what we rep we believe. And I never see anyone young on these, at these conversations. I and mean, don't you think we should say, let's bring on, you know, a couple 20 year olds, a couple 30 year olds, a couple high school kids. I mean, they see things that nobody else does. Yes, absolutely. And they challenge the thinking. They challenge folks out of the broken box. So I'll give you a practical example that I was proud to co-chair in, 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 as a school diversity advisory group to the city, to the Department of Education. And we had every stakeholder at the table. We had academics who do the research. We had advocates that do the advocacy. We had principals, school principals and teachers. We had a special ed teacher at the table, but we also had parents and students, even That's middle amazing. school students. We had middle school students. There is a fallacy too, that it has to be at least a high school student. No, it we should be middle school. I totally agree. And I have to tell you, you know, 
it was so critically important to hear their voices because some of the parents did not have the vision that some of the kids had. Yeah. Uh, and they also were generating their own ideas about what would improve public schools. And why would we not listen to the people being who are directly in it every day, mm -hmm. whether they're a teacher, a principal, or a kid? And what was fascinating to me about that is they pushed us, they pushed our thinking. But I think it also demonstrates how we build leadership and have a leadership pipeline. Because I can tell you, there was some middle schoolers in there mm -hmm. that I was like, you know, next generation of leaders that are leading now. They're not just next gen, they're leading now. And right. so it, it, we will be smarter if we engage more people. And uh, can I just say one thing, Joanne, about what we're doing as a campaign? Because this point is so important. It is also true that we have people in communities of all ages and experiences and backgrounds that have something to say about what can be better or smarter or different. Yes. So we're putting together people's assemblies and figuring out how to engage people. You don't even have to say you're going to vote for me. That's not that we want to hear people's ideas. We want to hear how, what would you prioritize? What's the most important thing to start with in your community? Because as we know, we are not going to do it all at once. No, we're and not. I, have you thought of using you know, a back-end technology which allows you to have these communities actually go online, fill out some kind of questionnaire and put it into documents that gives you a better understanding of this is consistent among this communities or wow, this community has a completely different issue than this one. Because this whole concept that we would go into these high schools and everyone would scream at each other and there's a moderator on stage, I always feel that the people in that room are the minority. They're just the majority in terms of how loud they are. Yeah, so that's a really important point. The question here really is about democratic practice and using every tool. And we definitely need to pull on and draw on technological tools. And we also can't lose you know, the fact that we have far too many New Yorkers that don't have the, the, the access to the no, technology. They do not. That's a with. huge issue too. It, it's a huge issue. So we need a both and. Uh, we need a both and, and we need a way, uh, and this is something I worked on in city government, as you know, and outside of city government as an advocate uh, and as an academic, is ensuring that the 21st century technology is something that is democratized, is something that everybody has and can utilize for civic engagement, for solving their problems, from see for seeing a doctor, for all the things we know it is increasingly necessary for. For sure, even to go to school, which is a huge issue in itself. So did yes. your kids protest this summer in the streets of New York? They sure did. My kids were protesting before the summer, uh, you know, like like kids the year before, if you remember the decolonize the subways. Yep. Uh, my kids were at those protests as well. And um, that meant they were also at the protests over the summer. And my older daughter insisted on going to the Bronx because that's where some of the harshest police crackdowns were, which terrified me as a mom, but we figured sure. out you know, we had a we had a system in place. But we were all we were all participating as much as we could. Uh, and seeing just how much of the demonstrations were really peaceful and just how much uh, escalation of tension was happening, unfortunately, with some of the ways yes. that demonstrations were being policed, which was wrong and must change. It must change. So what did this summer mean to you as we all sat back and, you know, I mean, these days there's so much being pushed at us, um, you know, from the Trump administration that gives, I think, every American anxiety on a daily basis of what's going to happen today. But the summer, you know, it, you felt like there was there was change. People were getting involved. There was a turning point. We were seeing things that only few of us get to see more in urban areas than anything else. Like, what did this summer mean to you as you think about the importance of change. Yeah, well, the summer meant a lot to me uh, and it meant a lot in a complicated set of ways. At first, it, as someone who sat at the table with a small number of people, uh, with my friend and mentor, John Powell, Professor John Powell, when, when he coined the phrase structural racism and having spent literally a dozen years of my advocacy career trying to get people to understand structural racism, to see multiracial demonstrations 
across the country as well as in the city mm -hmm. where folks started saying structural racism, where on cable television, folks like me were now able to, on cable television, talk about what it means, what structural racism means, systemic racism, structural racism. That was a sea change in the consciousness of, of the country. Now, uh, it was also devastating, right? And as we saw, both devastating because once again, we had to have another video of another tortured and murdered black man or person uh, in order to get there. And it's taken so many black lives for that to happen. And I do think coronavirus may have, I mean, I think it was there for a long time because yeah. organizers have been organizing on this since Trayvon Martin in a very active way. And we, we shouldn't forget that this the activism didn't happen overnight. It was building for years. Yeah. Uh, secondly, but secondly, you know, the retrenchment that we also started to see from the New York City Police Department. Uh, and I felt that it was aided and abetted by the Trump administration in the sense that some of the things that we were seeing were things we were seeing the federal agents do in Portland. And, and like, like throwing a protester in a van, yeah. in an unmarked van and disappearing them. Um, that was that was that was that was stark. But what was even more stark was to have here in New York City, the New York City Police Department with over two dozen riot geared police officers and helicopters overhead doing uh, conducting a six hour siege on the apartment of a Black Lives Matter activist for using a bullhorn in a demonstration two months before and having no arrest warrant. That is a police state that was not like anything for all of the abuses we have seen. I have never seen anything like that, uh, at least since I've been in I mean, city, out of city government. So you shocking. go up Fifth Avenue and you go and stand in front of the Trump Towers. There are three armed guards. I mean, we are talking armed guards. I mean, they look as though they would be standing in front of, you know, somewhere that is insanely important and fearful in Israel. You know, they don't, and when you see them in New York City, you think, why? Why, why do you have to, what's the point of this fear that you're creating this underlying, like, should I be walking the streets? You know, why do you need all these guns? Wouldn't one gun be fine? You know, why do you need these huge shotguns? I mean, you know, when you look at all this, I mean, you served as the chair of the CCRB, you know, what are your views in terms of reforming the New York Police Department? Yeah, look, we need a soup to nuts transformation of how we even think about policing and what it is and what it does. You know, and so I, I think of it in three buckets. Okay. The first is we got to put the public back in public safety. And what I mean by that is we have to have a strong city hall dictating with the input of people, with the input of residents, with the input of other elected leaders, what the policies and priorities of policing are. We shouldn't be told what they are by the police department. We should tell them what they are. And I'll just give you one practical example. Uh, when I say policy, excessive force. Excessive force is, is, one, is a critically important policy. Uh, in Camden, New Jersey, they made it an 18 page policy, very explicit about what you can and cannot do as a police officer. And as a result of 18 pages of clarity, they have radically reduced police violence uh, excessive force. We have a couple of pages and most of the time uh, we're constantly fighting about how much discretion police officers get. Well, let's make the rules of the road quite clear. That also helps on, on cl creating clarity for police officers about what will get them in trouble. And that's something they've asked for. So let's give it to them. But it's also what, you know, we have to right size it. It has grown far too large. It's militarized in a way, as I putting out the militarization of that siege on a resident it for exercising insane. first mm -hmm. amendment rights is outrageous it why is. are we paying for so uh, and there's there's federal money in that there's a long history about how that happened 
We had a mayor bragging about his private army, which was the New York City Police Department. I don't think that's something any mayor should brag about. But right sizing it, meaning what should police be doing and what should police not be doing? So if we're getting so many calls to police departments, and we just saw this in Philadelphia, right? Unfortunately, with Walter Wallace Jr., but it happens in New York City too, where what you have is a mental health problem. Well, that's the worst. And there's so many calls to the police department that are really mental health problems. And there should be someone else to call. And it should not be the job of the police department. And we should right size the police department, not, not spend up blue uniforms and badges to do mental health work. Scale that back to what we need to actually police violence, the, to, police, to police the gun running, uh, to, to police the kinds of things we absolutely want the police to police and, and take the resources and make sure we're creating the responses so the police do not get those calls and a professional that knows what to do gets that call. We're and really that- be part of the community as well. And that and, goes down to housing too. I want yeah. them to live in my neighborhood. <laughs> well, residency is a real conversation. And what we're looking at is a residency requirement. Uh, be connected to the community. The other thing that people don't realize about the New York City, so community policing, I'm a big, big believer in community policing and those relationships. But community policing as it currently exists in the New York City Police Department is a unit. It's a part of the policing. It is not what policing is. And really the the, the, the framework that has existed for it, for, for almost 30 years, it has never been taken to scale despite some really interesting research around it, is problem-oriented policing. That's a community policing that also focuses on where and how can we partner both with community but also with other agencies of government to solve problems. Sometimes it's the best thing police can do is point to other parts of government that there's a problem that shouldn't be treated as a criminal problem. That was Eric Garner. That was Eric Garner selling untaxed cigarettes. That was not a criminal justice problem. That was a poverty problem. That Completely. called for a different response than a crackdown and arrest. And so a problem-oriented policing would say, we know what's going on in the community and we can point out to government and to other community leaders how we can partner on making it not a crime problem when it, when it should be solved as a humanitarian problem or as an economic development problem or as some other problem that should be solved in some other way. And that's just a different way at looking at public safety and investing in it. And, and there is a role that police could play in that kind of model, but it, it has to change how they think about the job. And that's why we need civilian oversight that sets those priorities. And, you know, I mean, as you know, New York City is such a city of resilient people, right? And I think we are um, primed to return after COVID, just like 9-11, just like Sandy. Um, you know, how do we get New York back after COVID, which we are still sure when this whole thing is going to end in regards to restaurants and um, what are schools going to look like? But, but what is we going to use commercial real estate? I mean, which is at the end of the day, those front storefront, those storefronts are, you know, the foundation of our communities. Absolutely. And so one is city government has to be creative with what it has and how it can partner with folks outside of government. So on restaurants, let me give, just give you an example. And I've talked to restaurant owners in my neighborhood, but also in you know, Southeast Queens and, and the South Bronx uh, in these quarters that have these important businesses that everyone loves that, that actually become gathering places for the community. Uh, so as we're going into winter, you know, it was a real benefit to them, obviously, to be able to spill out onto the street. It was fabulous. They, it was amazing because we all needed to be able to find each other, but also find each other safely. And it, it created a way for community to do that and still come together 
uh, despite COVID and do it in a way that could protect public health. And, and, and those business owners are just such, and many of them, you know, unsung heroes and sheroes, because often, even though they were restaurants, were figuring out ways to give food to people who were hungry, Completely. you know, while they were shuttered. I mean, it was an amazing, and that happened all over the city. But as we're getting into cold weather, anyone who's had the privilege of traveling in Europe knows folks sit outside in the cold weather. Yes, they do. Yeah, they <laughs> sit outside in the cold weather. So, but if the city, if, if I was mayor right now, I'd be figuring out how to help every single restaurant get support from the city to create that outdoor dining and gathering uh, in a way that is COVID safe with the heat lamps. And what business owners are up against right now is that they're really expensive. Uh, they're also in high demand. The city should have, could have cracked, uh, but but really become kind of central centralized place of getting them and distributing them either at a reduced cost or even for free in order to keep that part of the economy going and keep that sense of community going because it's it's both economic but it's also that sense of hope and resiliency and the places where we come together to solve some of our community problems well, so so I, I agree with you and I and there's more we could do on all talk forever things. but also the thing is that the restaurants you know that the, the the cost to run those restaurants have become so high the rents have gotten out of control and this is certainly going to have uh, a massive effect in a good way i think on the reality of um commercial real estate although i think many of the owners are still on a bus they haven't gotten off of it to see what really is happening yeah, I'm actually working right now with others on a commercial rent policy, and 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 there there are also some interesting proposals because we should have, uh, uh, as we as we recover from COVID, we should do, be doing it in a way that reimagines. Because as you're saying, Joanne, this was an issue before COVID. Yes, this was a, a crisis point for many small businesses. Ninety eight percent of our businesses are small businesses in the city. And it's one of the things that makes New York special. So recovering isn't just saying we're, we're all, we all we, we can all be back to work. It's saying we can all still have small entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and, and, have, and see it in every community. And that does mean commercial rent. So um, we need an affordability strategy for commercial rent like we create affordability strategy for homes. And we haven't really done that. And there's some, there's some folks that are thinking about that right now. I'm talking to folks. I'm also looking at what's happening at federal level because uh, there are also opportunities. This is something that Nydia Velasquez, who is our, in our congressional delegation from Brooklyn and heads small business services uh, out of the house, uh, senior leader on these topics, deeply committed. Um, and they're looking at it right now also at the federal level. So we should be both partnering at the federal level and figuring out our own local strategies to do exactly that. And the, the, the city should absolutely use every lever available to it. And, and, and that includes our small business services administration to really deploy to making sure that commercial rents mean our mom and pops can stay in business. I agree. New York City is, I mean, I think it's the capital of the world, right? I mean, it's the largest company in the, in, in, in the globe is, you know, what are some of the challenges that you are going to be facing? Um, I mean, everyone who is running for mayor, um, some are, you know, longtime politicians, some are new people. And how are you working on how do you develop your political base? I mean, you know, you came out of the box and everyone know now as you're running and um, you've got you know, not that long because it's June um, where we're all going to go to the polls and vote or yeah. go to our post offices and vote. Yeah, well, and, you know, it's it's and complicated by COVID, right? Uh, it's it's the the ways in which uh, we typically get out is harder. Yeah. So been, we have had, I think, I, I lost count of how many virtual events we've had <laughs> <laughs> and and. And virtual is, it helps because there are a lot of pockets, whether it's tenant associations, um, you know, or volunteer civic groups, you know, that meet, that are now meeting virtually because of COVID. So there is the way in which we're, we're making those connections because a big part of it really is just about helping people get to know me 
and meeting people. That makes total uh, but, sense. Yeah, and during the summer, you know, it was it wasn't as hard because we could be outdoors. I mean, there are groups that were having outdoor meetings. Uh, even our even my own community precinct uh, meeting was you know out in a courtyard of a building, and so they were still meeting question now is what happens as people go indoors but you know we're just talking to everyone about where and how they're gathering so that I can show up where they're gathering whether it's virtual uh, or outdoor uh, and physically safe yeah okay so my last question is how do you feel about all these ridiculous articles New York is dead <laughs> New York is dead long live New York <laughs> because we just rise out of the ashes like a phoenix we always have and the reason i am running is not because new york won't recover it will it will the question is are we reimagining the city as we recover so that we're not just going backward to where we were in january because so much was already broken then about this wonderful city. There were far too many people who couldn't afford the rent. And that's from very low income people and extremely low income people to the middle class. Yeah. Too many small businesses who couldn't afford their rent. Childcare, you know, one of the top costs uh, for any family in this city. And we need, and we've made some progress, right? With UPK and 3K. We have to then get to the next level of progress on that. And 600,000 people in this city did not have health insurance before COVID. So I'm not going to be satisfied with a recovery that is simply going back to 600,000 people not being able to see a doctor when they're sick. Uh, we're, we need to figure out a way that this city uses its powerful bargaining power. We, we as a city, buy health insurance for 350,000 people already. So we need to think creatively about how we get more people insurance cards and how we do that as a city. And so that's reimagining, not just recovering. And that's our- Yeah, yeah, I like that, reimagine New York. All right, well, thank you so much for joining. I always love hearing you speak. Your passion just comes through. And, um, and, and all the policies that you're talking about are things that I am passionate about and feel really much on the same um, wavelength of how you're thinking about reimagining things. So um, as you know, I'm a big supporter and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching you on the trail. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate you, jo Joanne. And I actually appreciate just how many New Yorkers feel the way you feel. And that's, that just brings me tremendous excitement about what we're gonna do.